All right, case seven is a 75 year old man. Um, and this is from the nose and there's two slides here. I'll show you both from low power and then someone can uh, tell me about him. Here's the next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so it's a pretty large, uh, I don't know if this is a um, decisional or shave, um, but we're looking at a, a pretty densely, uh, an area with like a lot of dense sebaceous glands. Some of them look a little more hypertrophic or a, or a little enlarged. There's a background of uh, sclerosis as well here, kind of thickened upper dermis than I would expect for dermis for the nose. Um, overall, some of there is in various different areas. I'm seeing more perifollicular, uh, peri, perifollicular and perisebaceous uh, inflammation that looks more uh, lymphocytic uh, at low power. Good. And what about this? Little, oh yeah. Okay, so we also have some uh, like early granulomas appearing Good. as well. Um, and then cells. And in other views, I was seeing plasma cells. Yeah, good, there are. Here's some giant cells, some lymphs, and there are some plasma cells. It's sometimes hard to get them to show up, but there's a few plasma cells scattered in there. Uh huh. And then let me uh, show you the next slide to give you some different views. Here, a lot more expanded sclerotic collagen, as you nicely picked up even in the, the last slide, very good, and probably some plasma cells right here. See, plasma cells look big from low power because they've got a lot of cytoplasm. So if you see an infiltrate that looks kind of darker and bigger than lymphocytes, probably gonna be plasma cells. That's like my clue. They always catch my eye. These are all plasma cells. And then the last thing is over here. What's going on here? Here's lower, and then here's higher. Okay, maybe there was like a foreign body reaction going on towards, uh, kind of just like a ruptured follicle. Good. Yeah, this is basically the pattern you see in ruptured folliculitis or ruptured cysts. Bunch of neutrophils filling up the lumen, necrotic debris, maybe some bacteria, plus minus, sometimes it's hard to tell it apart from debris. And then all these pink round cells, those are detached acantholytic keratinocytes, which can happen when you've got some, you know, skin, like some staph growing on the skin surface. Um, like uh, with, uh, you can see it sometimes in secondary impetigenization where you begin to get some falling apart of, of keratinocytes. I think that's what's going on here. That's not a, not a characteristic finding of this entity. It's just an incidental thing. But the neutrophils in this cystic space, you can see in this entity. So how do you put all of this together? There's a bunch of different stuff going on. What do you think is happening here? Uh, I was calling this uh, line of fire. Well done. I was going to say, this is kind of hard because A, it's not a tumor, and B, it's something that I don't feel gets talked about or even seen that often because it's often, you know, is is not, you know, it's recognized clinically and not biopsied. So you either see it as an incidental finding in the background of something else. I've unfortunately seen a couple cases of angiosarcoma growing in rhinophyma and clinically it was hard to pick up on because their nose was already multinodular and reddish and inflamed, um, which is really sad and terrible. I've seen some cases of that and other tumors. I've seen squamous cell carcinoma kind of hidden in the background of rhinophyma, really bad, aggressive ones, unfortunately. But but the, the times that I've gotten to see it is like this. This is actually from a time where they're doing the planing procedure, right? To remove and shave off the excess tissue and overgrowth and restructure and re-sculpt the nose because it's more than just, as you guys well know, but for anyone watching online, this is extra tissue from the nose. I mean, this is about as much normal tissue, a normal nose, if you took a whole slice off of it, would have about this much tissue. So if you don't, if you don't know how serious, not just cosmetically, but... Uh, comfort and morbidity wise, uh, rhinophyma when it's severe can really be morbid for the patient and incredibly disfiguring that their nose swells the multiple times the size of normal. It can ob ob obstruct their, um, their um, you know, uh, airflow through the nasal um, uh, openings. It can be really problematic and inflamed. I, I don't know if it's painful, but I imagine it must be because it gets all of these little pustules um, and ruptured inflamed cystic structures in it. 
And so I imagine it must be painful and uncomfortable. So sometimes, uh, oftentimes I see this done by either plastic surgeons or ENTs, although I think sometimes derms do it too, depending on, on the, their practice setting, but uh, where this can be planed off and removed. Um, and that's what this section was. And again, you can see cautery down here. There's cautery or electrosurgery artifact, the streamy stretched out keratinocyte nuclei, and this burning and smudging of the collagen. See how the collagen gets more lavender or purple kind of color compared to the bright pink it should be? That means it's been burned by electricity. So in, um, in any case, this is rhinophyma, beautifully done. And all of these different features in varying proportions can be seen in rhinophyma. The way I kind of conceptually think of it is that it's, it's kind of a follicular occlusion process where you get uh, sebaceous hyperplasia and dilated cystic change to the hair follicles. Then they can have, and, and this is probably on a spectrum with or in some way related to rosacea, right? So you often have the rosacea findings of sebaceous hyperplasia with perifollicular lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. But you begin to get uh, inflammation inside these follicles, sometimes neutrophilic. The follicles and cystic spaces rupture open, which incites a granulomatous foreign body reaction to the keratin. And then you get subsequent scarring of the dermis, which gets more and more scarred down and sclerotic over time, which blocks down more of those hair follicles, which makes them cystic, which makes them rupture. Kind of the similar kind of process as you see like in acne keloidalis nuke. I think it is much more complicated probably than that, but that is at a simple level the way I conceptually imagine how this process happens and progresses over time. And you can see this is scar, right? Dense scarred dermis. This is never going to return to normal. Once dermis gets so sclerotic, the scar may change and remodel over time, but you're never going to get back to normal pristine dermis, right? So removing it is the way to kind of make it go back to a more normal shape after they re-sculpt the nose. And this is also a really perfect example of sebaceous hyperplasia throughout this specimen. And our little friend, the Demodex mite, this is Demodex brevis, the species that lives down in the sebaceous ducts, way down in the lobules. And then a Demodex folliculorum is the one that tends to live up in the infundibulum of the hair follicle. So try that out on your friends at your next cocktail party and see uh, how impressed they are. This may explain a lot about my social life, but oh look, there's another Demodex. Look, I mean, they're just wanting to eat some sebum. They're not trying to cause a problem. As you know, some people do seem to have some sort of hypersensitivity or allergic response to them, and there's debate over what role they play in causing or exacerbating rosacea, at least in a subset of patients. But overall, although people online like to post on my videos and tell me that they invade your body and cause all sorts of terrible problems, overall, demodex do not, like, they do not invade. If they get into the dermis, they will die. They can only live in the openings here of the sebaceous duct and the follicle where they munch on this fatty sebaceous secretion and um, and don't uh, usually cause any problems again, except that there's exceptions to people who have like demodicosis and a, and a hypersensitivity kind of response to them. Okay, so that is a really good example of the range of features that you can see in rhinophyma. And don't forget to look around carefully in these specimens to make sure that there's no coexisting tumor that happens to be growing there, hiding clinically you know, clinically um, not recognized because it's hiding in the background of a multinodular, large, firm, reddish, erythematous, you know, nose um, in an older adult who probably has lots of skin abnormalities if they are sun damaged. So just keep that in mind that you can have more than one thing on the slide. Any questions? Okay, and that, that rhinophyma with angiosart case, I actually have that um, in, in process to be scanned eventually and will eventually be posting that online and releasing it um, uh, as a really good warning of the, the dangers of that potentially happening.